Thank you for joining the NBMI experience today. We expect this to be life-changing for you as it has been for us. Let's get right to the work. I got, I got, I got, I got, come on, I got the power. Tell them I got the power. 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 Woo! You don't want me to start doing the running man, because I will. Y'all don't know this, Pastor. I got some challenges last night. They told me that there's another pastor like me. I said, what? I got to kick this up a little bit. Because testimonies is what's going to build up this ministry, period. Your worship, your testimony, your exaltation of God by recognizing the phenomenal things that he's doing is what's going to build you up. It's going to build up the person next to you. It's going to build up everybody in this church, and it's going to build this church up. How many say amen? In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah. God is good. Let me tell you, I, I didn't think that I got the power was going to touch home as much as it has. You know, and I was preparing this week, and, and God has a, a very mysterious, phenomenal, awesome, supernatural way of working things, and I'm just so excited. Aren't you excited? I'm excited. I gotta kind of stop and just remind myself how excited I am. It's awesome to see Abigail here. It's awesome to see all you guys here. It's just phenomenal to know that even those Memorial Day people have a memorial of God above every vacation spot, above every sand, every, about every beach, and about every park that's out there. Let me tell you something. The day is about 12 o'clock. We're done, and we can go anywhere we want, but we have to bring memory of our Lord and Savior first. Amen. And I'm excited because, because this, this preaching, to me, is going to be the difference between us making the $20 and us making the $80. What are you talking about, Pastor? What I'm talking about is Chris, in his, in his youth, didn't realize that God just prospered him. He quadruplicated. I'm telling you, he, he didn't just say, here's an extra 20 because you were faithful. And he said, I'm going to quadruplicate you. The God that I serve works in quadruples and octuplets and sextuplets and on and on and on. You see, my God is not limited for addition. He's a God of multiplication. Tell the person next to you, multiplication. Mm. That's power. Come on. Come on. That's power. You remember math class, and I know you guys must be like, this pastor is always talking about math. I love math. I love it. I dream math. I dream numbers. Forget about it. You remember in math class when you started doing exponentials and when they started talking to me, I would love to know how she's translating exponentials, but that's a different story for a different day. And, and when they would say, you know, take your seventh to the second power, you remember? And then you have to take seven times what? Seven. That's how you, that's how you would do seven to the second power. And then you would start, you know, just going on and on and, and, and adding exponentials that were just ridiculous. And, and you would see how a small number would just become so grand just because. Like, I remember when I was in my first seminary, I think it was the third level seminary, and I remember we were doing the study on the portion of Scripture where it talks about how many times we're supposed to forgive our brethren. And if you read the Scripture correctly, it says that you're supposed to forgive them 70 to the seventh power. The original version says 70 to the seventh power. So our teacher asked us how many times, and everybody, all the smart people say, oh, 490 times. <clears throat> and I said, well, I said, no, 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 that's wrong. I said, it's 70 to the seventh power. So then you start taking 70 and you start going to the seventh power and it's a number that the calculator gives you an E at the end. You know why an E? Because it just keeps going and keeps going and keeps going and keeps going. That's forgiveness. Our God works in that exponential power. I want to talk to you about exponential power today. I want to talk to you about the power that, that God has truly Last week we talked about power based on Luke 10, 19. I'm going to read it for you. It says, Behold, I have given you authority and power to trample upon serpents and scorpions and physical and mental strength and ability over all the power. What power? Come on. Over what? All the power. Come on. You guys got to snap out of it. Let me tell you something. I see Pastor Elizabeth, and Pastor Elizabeth, she's sweating, and, and she's just all into this worship, and she's moving around, and you got to see her heels. She's got like 10-inch heels, and I love it. All the married people know what I'm talking about. I say, oh. 
So anyway, so she's got 10-inch heels, and she's like figuring a way to dance. And a lot of us are like, oh, glory to God. Glory to God. You got to snap out of it. Power is power. I told you, I gave you the example of the gym last week and how these guys, these huge, enormous guys, they're like, oh! and then they drop the weights so everybody can see them. And then they get up and they're looking in the mirror. You know what I'm talking about? They're excreting power. Power is just coming out of every pore of their body. And that's how we as Christians got to be. We got to come into worship. And when we're singing about this is how I know what love is, you got to get excited and you got to get into it and you got to get amped up. His love is so great. His exponential love said, I'm not going to buy you a 10 carat ring. I'm not going to give you a new house. I'm going to give you my everything. I'm going to give you my soul. I'm going to give you my blood. I'm going to give you my body. I'm going to give it all up for you. That's exponential power. You know, we think that giving an apology is like this big thing. And we walk around, we're like, I'm going to apologize even though I wasn't at fault. And we think we're like the next, you know, we're the last Coca-Cola in the desert. Wow, look, I apologize and it wasn't my fault. Congratulations. Jesus didn't apologize. Jesus went and said, I'm going to give it even though I didn't do anything. Even though I walk perfectly, I'm going to give it all. And we look at it from the outside and we say, Jesus, how? I'm not Jesus. We all say that. We say, I'm not Jesus. I'm not Jesus. But we're supposed to become like Jesus. Amen? And when you realize that you have the power inside of you to become like Jesus, all of a sudden you start doing things like apologizing when it's not your fault and it's nothing. You're like, whatever. It doesn't make a difference. It's not a biggie. It's not a big deal. Why? Because at the end of the day, there's one being that looks at you and he smiles. And let me tell you something. There's nothing greater than putting a smile on the face of God. Nothing greater. Let me tell you, I, you know, growing up, I've been in my company for 21 years now. So when you do something and you know that your boss is going to like it, you go out of your way to tell your boss, yeah, well, today I did this. And, and, you know, I'm known in my company to have the highest profitability in the company. So, you know, there's jokes, not towards me, but about me, about, you know, how how you're Christian and you're able to do this. And I'm like, look, I maximize my profitability because I believe that my time is worth it. If I service you, I expect to be paid for that service. And, and I'll go out of my way to tell my boss, you know, I made this much on this. And he smiles. He's like, of course he smiles. He's the one making the money. I get the penis. He's making the money. Now, I get excited when I'm able to do that for my human boss. Can you imagine how excited I get when I know that I can bring a smile to the face of my daddy? And, and everybody around you may say, wow, that was such a giving thing. That was such a loving thing. And you're like, that's cool, but I'm doing it for him. And every one of us, when we, when we really put our head into the game and realize that all the good stuff we're doing, we're really doing it for him, all of a sudden it's going to take your ability and your desire to do good stuff to a next level. You're not going to look at it as, oh, it's a drag for me to do the right thing. You're going to look at it and say, I got the power to do the right thing. I got the capability to do the right thing. You're not going to walk in to a, a funeral home where everybody's crying and say, you know what, uh, 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 I'm going to have to go in there and cry. No, no, you walk in with power and you say, I've got a, I got something to tell you. There's a celebration that should be taking place here. Because that person that was dead, you know, they would want us to celebrate their life, not mourn their life. And, and it takes a lot of power to be able to go in and, and transform somebody's frown and somebody's tears into joy and realize that you're right. You know what? That person was here for X amount of years. I was able to, to connect with that person. I was able to share with that person. I was able to spend time with that person. That person blessed me. I blessed that person. You know what? I shouldn't be mourning. I should be celebrating the life of that, poor, of that person. How many say amen? But it takes power to come out of the natural, you see. And that's what this preaching is all about. It's all about getting us out of that natural state of mind, that natural, uh, a complex state of mind that as humans we get into. Where we think, I can only believe if I see. And God is saying, I want you to see. I want you to actually believe so that I can allow you to see what's going to happen. You see, we're all focusing on the small stuff. We're focusing on today, and God is saying, today is done already. I'm five miles ahead of you. I want you to come and walk at my pace. I want you to walk with me. And today we're going to see two examples. Tell the person next to you two examples. We're going to see two examples. We're going to see two examples of people in Scripture, and we're going to see two different perspectives of these people. Let's go together. Let's start out. We're looking in Luke chapter 1, verse 5 to 25. 
days when Herod was king of Judea, there was a certain priest whose name was Zechariah of the daily service, the division of Abiah, and his wife was also a descendant of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. And they both were righteous in the sight of God, walking blamelessly in all the commandments and requirements of the Lord. But they had no child, for Elizabeth was barren, and both were far advanced in years. Now, while on duty, serving as priest before God in the order of the division, as was the custom of the priesthood, it fell to him by lot to enter the sanctuary of the temple of the Lord and burn incense. And all the throng of the people were, play, were praying outside in the court at the hour of incense burning. And there appeared to him an angel of the Lord standing at the right side of the altar of incense. And when Zechariah saw him, he was troubled and fear took possession of him. I want to stop there for a second. This experience of troubledness that Zechariah felt is very frequent in the church of God. We become troubled when we see the manifestation of God come to reality before us. Why? Why do testimonies make us so excited? Why do we get so excited when we've been praying for something and something happens? Because our expectation is down low. Zechariah was the priest. He was the pastor. He was the person that day that was leading worship. He was the person that day that was taking all the offerings and he was presenting them before God. He was supposed to be basically that person that was before God and the people that day. He should have known that God was going to manifest. Amen? There should have been no doubt. But the problem is that as human, we have something that we talked about last week and it's called senses. And our senses are the worst and best thing that we can have. Why? If we don't train our senses to go according to God's senses, then what's going to happen is our senses are going to drag us and our expectations are going to be low. And God is trying to convert our expectations where instead of believing the negative and instead of believing for the minimal, we start believing for the positive and we start believing for the maximum. Tell the person next to you, maximum. Believe for your maximum. When you get alarmed because a miracle happened, the reason you're getting alarmed is because you didn't believe for your maximum. It's like a salesperson that gets excited about a sale because they doubt it in their own abilities of being able to make that sale. When people see you and they believe that you believe in yourself, they believe in whatever you're selling. It doesn't matter what it is. Too many of us don't believe in the product that we're exposing. In fact, too many of us are hiding our product. We're saying, you want to bu buy Christianity? Huh? Yeah, you want to buy it? I'm Christian. Look at me. I'm happy. Right or wrong? And we walk around we're like, yeah, I'm Christian. I go to church every Sunday. Congratulations. There's got to be a different demeanor in us. You got to get excited about being a Christian. You got it, man. People got to be like, whoa, I want what he has. I want what she has. Let me tell you, you want, you want to see excitement out of me? Let's talk about desserts. My favorite restaurant, everybody knows where it is. I go there, and I got this brownie that has a nice fat glop of vanilla ice cream on it. And then there's this apple pie that I don't even need to eat the apples. I just eat the crust and throw a dulce de leche ice cream on top, and it's off the charts. You see how excited I am? Right now, my heart probably just increased with like 50%. No, 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 no. And it's just saying fat. I love it. I get excited. I get excited about the product. There's no doubt that when I taste that ice cream, it's going to melt in my mouth, and there's going to be explosions over every salary gland that's inside of my mouth. Can I get an amen? It's like when you talk to a Peruvian person, they talk about that ceviche on top of that white rice or the papa guancaina, right? And they're like, oh, man. Or a Dominican, and you start talking about platanos and, and maduros and, and mangu, and, and you just get so excited about these things because you can taste them. You could taste it. I don't have to put it before you. Your senses are telling you exactly how it tastes. I mean, if I describe to you a food right now that's your favorite food, can you really tell me that? I mean, let's talk about McDonald's french fries. Mm. 
when they're right out of the oil and you're biting them and they crunch and you taste the salt and you know like I know that when nobody's looking you start licking your fingers I see Pastor Elizabeth all the time doing that she hides I'm like babe where were you she goes no and she got salt all over her face but I can describe it to you and you could taste it you could literally man you could smell it you could smell it coming out of the oven. You could smell, my gosh, do you follow what I'm saying? Your senses are just exploding right now. Now, what about when we talk about God? Do your senses explode when you talk about God? Do you really, like, do you get into it so much that you're like, no doubt, whatever the situation is, whatever the obstacle is, you know that that situation will solve that problem? I mean, if I tell you, man, you know what, I, my stomach is turning, I'm upside down, I don't feel good, I don't feel this, I don't feel, I don't, I feel sick, but all of a sudden I put your favorite food before you, all of a sudden you're like, okay, I just won. And all of a sudden you start feeling better because you can, you, you just know the result that that food is going to give you. You know it. You know how good it is to take a Wendy's Frosty and dip a McDonald's French fry in it and stick it in your mouth. You know how explosive that can be, Right? Or Five Guys Burgers. There you go. You see, I know they're a little greasy for me, but our Five Guys Burger. <laughs> thank you, thank you. <laughs> you got what you got. What I'm saying. There's a, a automatic expectation, automatic result that you know this is what's going to come of it. This is it. This is it. There's no doubt about it. There's not even an iota of doubt that it's going to taste good. That at the moment that I bite that burger, it, the explosion happens. That at the moment that I eat that onion, it, you just know it. It's predestined. It's computed in your mind. Now, God has left us time and time again, example and example of healings, example and example of victories, example and example of victories, example and example of prosperity over and over and over, thousands of years ago, three months ago, two days ago, today. But where's our expectation? And that's what I want this preaching to get us to. You see, Zechariah was troubled because what he went there to do actually happened. Oh my God! The angel of the Lord showed up. What did you expect in church? What did you expect when you started worshiping God? What did you expect to happen when all of a sudden that burnt incense started going up before the presence of God that you gave from a pure heart? What did you expect happening? But do you want to know why it happened? Because of everything they talked about before that. He had no child. His woman was barren, and they were old. But guess what? He knew a story of a young man named Abraham and a woman named Sarah that lived a very similar life. He knew that testimony already. Yet, in his mind, he kept burning incense before God. And that's the key. Power wasn't the angel of the Lord appearing. Power was his ability to still go to church, to still burn the incense, to still have the priesthood, even though he didn't have the result that he wanted yet. And that's the key. There is so many part-time Christians today in Christianity, people that come in and go out because they want to see the result right now. But you see, you don't get the result that lasts forever unless you stick your face in the house of God and you worship him in good and in bad times. That's when you see the angel of the Lord appear, and here you can see it. But Zacharias was troubled. He said, oh my Lord, the angel of God showed up. Oh my gosh, I came to church and I prayed for healing and I was healed. And immediately we start thinking, is this going to be short term? Is this really gone? Is it for real? I, I mean, I remember my last missions trip, I, I think I shared with you guys, we had this line of people and, and there was people there. I mean, the, the one that really impacted me was this woman that said, I can't feel. I have had a paralysis almost my entire life on the left side of my body. And, and, man, God was moving so powerfully that day that there was, like, no doubt. There was no doubt. It was like, you're up there, you're healed. All you got to do is one thing, believe. And there was people that went up there and didn't believe. 
There was people, there was, there was a person that went up there blind. And God showed us that God was going to heal him that day. And we told them, all you have to do is confess that God can heal you. And you will receive your, your, your ability to see again. And he said, I can't. I can't. We said, you can do it. He goes, I'm not worthy. And God took us to another level of expressing to this man, you have the capability. You are worthy. Who told you you're not? It's just, I've done this, and I've done that, and this is my life, and, and I left this church, and I left that church. And religious scrutiny, and religious backbiting, and religious hatred had this man caught up in a state of blindness that till today he still finds himself in. Having the capability of being healed, he couldn't believe for his own healing. And we may say, wow, how can he not do it? How do we not? Every week when we come in, and, and I'm sure just like me, we all have our little laundry list of things. God, I need help with this. I need help with that. I need help with this. And we're like, okay, God, I'm here. And, we, and sometimes we get amped up. You know what I'm talking about. Those days that you're in the car and you're listening to gospel music, you're like, mm -hmm. And you come in and you're like, all right, Lord, I'm here and I'm ready and I'm able. And then God starts working and it, it just becomes too much for you. And you're like, oh, Lord, wait, Lord. Not, not everything at a time. J just give me a little bit. No, no, no. God doesn't work in little bits. He doesn't want to string you along. You know how you do it to mice? You put a little bit here and a little bit here until you get to the trap and that's where you put the big thing. All of us are expecting this spiritual trap that we're going to get into. And Oh, no, you see? That's what happened. Now they want my tithes and offerings. Pause and laugh. It's not about your tithes and offerings. Your tithes and offerings are a complete example of what Zechariah did right here. He said, you know what? I'm not a millionaire, but I'm going to give God a little bit of what's here, what I do have. Here it is, Lord. And all of a sudden when you do that, you're releasing power, and that power makes the Spirit of God manifest. And here comes the angel of the Lord, and he manifests over your life. And watch what happens. But wait, wait, it gets better, like an infomercial. But wait, we have more. Verse 13, it says, But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah, because your petition was heard, and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you must call his name John. God is favorable. So now you know the angel of the Lord is telling him, this is what's going to happen. Amen? What's an angel? A messenger. Okay? What do we do here on Sunday mornings? We bring a what? A message. So if the message tells you that you can do all things through Christ Jesus that strengthens you, can you do all things through Christ Jesus that strengthens you? Watch this. Verse 14. Not only does the angel tell him he's going to do it, but he tells him this is the name you're going to give. Verse 14, he says, And you shall have joy and exultant delight, and many will rejoice over his birth. Verse 15, for he will be great and distinguished in the sight of the Lord, and he must drink no wine nor strong drink, and he will be filled with and controlled by the Holy Spirit, even in and from his mother's womb. Wow, you can't get any more detail than that. Amen? And let's continue. And he will turn back and cause to return many of the sons of Israel to the Lord their God. And he will himself go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah. And the what? Come on. And the what? Power of Elijah to turn back the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient and incredulous and unpursuable persuadable, sorry, to the wisdom of the upright, which is the knowledge and holy love of the will of God, in order to make ready for the Lord a people perfectly prepared in spirit, adjusted and disposed, and placed in the right and moral state. In 18, watch this. Now, let me ask you a question. I'll pause for a second. If God told you, you're going to have a child, you're going to name him John, this is what he's going to do. This is his mission. He's going to work similar to this person, and he's going to do this, this, and this, and this, and that. What would be your reaction? Thank you. That's a good reaction. Amen. Let it be. Let's see Zacharias's. And Zacharias said to the angel, 
but what shall I know and be sure of this? McFly, he just told you his name. He told you what he was going to do. He told you who he was going to be like. And you're asking, how do you know that this is going to be? What is he doing? Doubting. He's not releasing power. My gosh, the Spirit of God sent the angel of the Lord down to heaven to meet this man because his offering was coming before his presence. God told them point by point what was going to happen, and he still didn't believe. He said, how do I know this is going to happen? I don't know. Maybe because God took it out of his time to send his angel down to heaven to talk to you. I mean, do we take prophecy and the word of God that lightly? Do we automatically doubt it because our senses tell us that's still the pastor or that's still the elder or that's still so and so? Let me tell you something. I'll share with you. In that same missions trip, God used that same blind man to bring a prophetic word to somebody that was in that house that day that broke down detail by detail by detail of what the person was going through and where the person was going. The same person that couldn't believe for his own was given detailed explanations to someone else about what they had to do. Now, in human terms, you can look at the blind man and say, you're blind. You can't even help yourself. And you're going to come tell me that God speaks through you? Yes. If God can use a blind man, and if we can see God use children, and if we can use, see God use adulterers and fornicators and, and prostitutes and all these other things to do his will, then why do we take things that God brings us and discount them because of the vessel that he uses? If you were in the desert, and I took a dirty cup, and you hadn't drank water for six days, and I gave you a cup of water in a dirty cup, would you drink that water? I wouldn't care if there was bugs swimming in it. I wouldn't care if the water was green. Six days of not drinking water, give me what you got, because that's going to replenish my strength. But too many of us are in the storm, we're in the desert, God is offering us water, and we're saying, nope. I want it filtered. It's not clean enough. Give it to me through a nice cup. Lord, you know what I was brought up in. I was brought up this way. You have to give it to me this way. He doesn't have to do nothing. He pleases to give you what you need, not what you want. Power is the ability to understand that no matter what that gift looks like, it's for good. Why? Because the Word, through His messenger, tells you that all things work for good for those who love the Lord. So as long as you love the Lord, guess what? Whatever that gift is that He's given you is going to work for good. Tell the person next to you, it's going to work for good. And Zechariah said to the angel, By what shall I know and be sure of this? For I am an old man, and my wife is well advanced in years. And the angel replied to him, I am Gabriel. I stand in the very presence of God, and I have, be, I have been sent to talk to you and to bring you this good news. Now, I could imagine the angel of God was just like, I'm Gabriel. It's like saying, hello, I'm right here. I'll give you my name. You want to know why? Look at me, I'm here. And all of a sudden now, Zechariah looks at him and look what he says. He goes, now behold. Watch what happens, because Zechariah still didn't believe. So the angel says, now behold, you will be and will continue to be silent and not able to speak to the day when these things take place because you have not believed what I told you. But my words are of a kind which will be fulfilled in the appointed and proper time. Man, watch this. Highlight. You want to know why I highlighted that? I got to read it one more time. Now behold, you will be and will continue to be silent and not able to speak. Why? 
because Zechariah wasn't going to emphasize anything good out of his mouth. He was just going to come up with a list of reasons why it wasn't going to happen. And God don't want to hear your list of reasons why what he says is not going to happen. So if he has to shut you up, he will shut you up. Tell the person next to you, you might get shut up if you don't believe. Dígale, Rosy, dígale. Now you can say it. Pablo. Adiós, Pablo. Es que si tú no crees, no vas a poder hablar. Dígale. In your best Dominican. Because that's the truth. Why? Because God wants us to know something. That our senses, our physical senses, are getting in the way of our blessings. Some of us need to just shut up. Don't tell the person next to you to shut up. But tell yourself, you know what, self? Shut up. And sometimes we got to tell our ears, stop listening. And many times we got to tell our eyes, stop looking. Why? Because we keep looking and saying, look at the storm that I'm in the middle of. Do you think I'm going to be able to survive? You're on a boat that Jesus Christ is laying in the bed on the knees, and he's saying everything's going to be all right. But you're saying, but Lord, look. And he's saying, I don't have to look. I created that. I don't have to hear. I created this. And he's telling you today, and he's telling me today, that despite what our physical senses may be telling us at this very moment, he has a plan for us. He's given that plan a name. He's telling you that that plan is going to be executed and is going to be used to bring back those that are lost. So he's telling us today, if it's necessary, we will walk out of here and not be able to say a lick about it. If we don't shut up and start believing, we're going to be shut up completely. You don't have to try to convince anyone but yourself. We walk around and we're like, this is the call that God had for my life. You? Really? Yeah, you know, I'm going to seminary. I'm going to this. I'm going to... You don't have to pull out your resume. They're not going to believe you anyway. They didn't believe Jesus. The Word of God says that in his hometown, he couldn't do many miracles because they didn't believe Jesus Christ, the Messiah. And you want to prove your whole family to believe because I am so-and-so. Congratulations, they ain't going to believe you. This is the reality. But it's all good because that doesn't stop the fact that God said it. He gave it a name. He gave it a direction. He said it's going to happen, and it's going to happen. Why? Because if I got to shut up, I'll shut up. He's going to make it happen. But Zechariah had to literally and figuratively be shut up because God said, I can't have your human senses getting in the way of my will for you. Many people would look at it and say, what kind of awful God is that? What kind of awful God to make me be mute? Maybe being mute is the best thing that can happen to a lot of us. Maybe being blind is the best thing that can happen to a lot of us. Maybe not being able to hear, being deaf, is the best thing that can happen to many of us. What, Pastor? Yes, exactly that. Because if these ears or these eyes or this nose or this mouth is going to lead me away from him, then take it away. Because we need to be with him. Because when we're with him, we have everything we need. Everything, not something, everything. See, when you're in worship and you're in his presence and all of a sudden the angel of God comes down. See, if I was Zachariah, I, I mean, I say this because this is me, but I, I, I wouldn't be like, well, how do I know that's true? I'd be jumping up and down, yeah, Elizabeth, let's do this. That's another thing. If God tells you he's going to give you a baby, you got to work at it. Even the religious people right now. <laughs> it's all right. You got to work at it. If God tell you that he's going to heal you from cancer, from lung cancer, you better drop them cigarettes. If God tell you he's going to heal you from diabetes, you better put away those brownies. It's the truth. You got to work at it. Watch what happens. 21. 
Now the people kept waiting for Zechariah, and they wondered at his delaying so long in the sanctuary. I imagine Zechariah was in the church, and he goes, how am I going to explain this to people? Then think about it. How can I? I can't talk. 22, it says, but when he did come out, he was unable to speak to them, and they clearly perceived that he had seen a vision in the sanctuary. And he kept making signs to them, saying, uh, still, he remained dumb. 23. And when his time of performing priestly functions was ended, he returned to his own house. You know, I got to kick it back a, a little bit to that last verse. He remained dumb. What does that mean? To the eyes of everyone, he looked like he was dumb. To the eyes of everybody, he looked like he couldn't communicate. But in that time of quiet, I got to believe, was the closest he was able to get to God intimacy-wise. And you want to know how I know this? Because it's only when we get close to God that we're able to see the result of the promise. If he wasn't close to God during this time where God allowed him to shut up, he would have never seen John then born. He could have kept not believing. But how do you not believe when God physically comes down and says, you want to see with your eyes? Watch this. Mmm. 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 I can talk before. Why can't I talk now? You see, God took him out of his control. He said, it's not about what you do and what you don't do. It's about what I do. And I'm going to show you that I'm going to take away your control so that you don't think you can make my hand do something. I'm going to do it because I am God. And sometimes he has to allow us to get to our lowest common denominator so that he can do the work. And when the promise comes, we don't walk around saying, you see, it was because of what I did. It was because of the way that I thought to build the church. It was because of the way that I sang. It was because of the way that I preached. It was because of the way that I prophesied. It was because of the way that I touched that computer. It was because of the way that I gave her that five carat ring. It was because of the way. No, it's not because of us. It's because of him. The power is in us, but the power is his. It's all his. He's allowing us to use it. Look, it's like you came to my house and said, Pastor, I'm moving. I need your pickup. Here's the key. I'm allowing to use it. You can use it, but it's mine. Tell the person next to you, that ram is the pastor's. You can use it for a short time, and your result will get done. But that ram is mine. God is saying, you know what? Here's your blessing. You can use it, but remember where it came from. Remember who gave you that blessing. Remember how you got where you got. Remember that it's not about your glory. I mean, gosh. You know, the devil promised to take away all ability for us to create life. You know, we're talking about a physical example of a woman that was barren. Yeah, in the physical, that's bad. That's also defeatable. But let's talk about in the spiritual. You know, every one of us has an area in our life where we're barren, where we don't see life. Whether it's our inability to have a high self-esteem of ourselves, our inability to get past anger, our inability to get past hurt, our inability to get past whatever it is that you're dealing with, a sickness, a disease. Some of us is in the physical, some of us is in the mental, some of us is in the spiritual. Whatever it is, we all have something. Amen? And God is saying, I'm going to get past that in you, for you. I deposited something inside of you before you were born, before you were conceived, before you were even a thought. I put something inside of your heart, inside of your soul that was going to get you past the moment that you're going through. But the first thing that we say is, I can't see it. I can't hear it. Nobody tells me that they love me. How can I believe that somebody will love me one day? Nobody tells me that I'm good at something. How can I have a high self-esteem of myself? He told you that he made you after his own image. I know we don't believe that. We don't. Because we look around with our eyes and we say, but she looks like this and I look like this and she looks like that. It's not your physical image. It's the likeness. It's your spirit. There is something in our spirits. This week, my wife, we've been, uh, we're so close to getting a place to get out of this place. You know, and this week, my wife went to the bank, and then she went to meet a realtor, and she went over here, and, every, and she went to the building department. Everywhere she went, 
the people just, they had a likeness to her. And they would open up and they'd be like talking to her for an hour. And she'd be like, she's like, babe, these people don't even know me. They're telling me their life secrets. And it's that kindred spirit. It's that connection that only happens. That's what I'm talking about when it says that God created us after his own image. And when there's two things that are similar, they get along. It's like when you put a Met fan next to a Met fan or a Yankee fan next to a Yankee fan, they connect. They could be black, they could be white, they could be green, they could be purple. It doesn't matter. They don't look at that anymore. Now it's just, this is our common ground and we connect here. That likeness is our common ground. I mean, come on, let's be real. Where was this Spanish guy going to end up that he was going to be able to talk to a guy from Trinidad and connect the way I connect with Brother Peron? Come on. Come on. Let's be real. Or, or, or I'm going to connect to my Mexican brother Miguel. Where am I going to connect? Or I'm going to connect to a Dominican sister like Ms. Rosimi. Dominicans and Colombians practically don't like each other. Right? It's a known thing. But there's a connection. There's a likeness to all of us. And that likeness is something that God deposited in us. It's not about me being your friend and, oh, well, we go out to eat together. We go here together. We go out. Let me tell you something. I am closer in my spirit to some people here that I've never broken a piece of bread with. Why? Because there's a likeness in our spirit. There is people that I can trust that I don't break bread with more than people that I eat with every day. Because there's a likeness in our spirit. Because I know that I know that I can trust in that person. Why? Because that person understands their responsibility before. They know they're structured by him. They know that we were put here together by him. It's not about, oh, look, pastor, please coddle me. Pastor, let's have coffee. Pastor, let's have this. Let, they don't need any of that. That comes with a package. But you don't really want to hang out with me. Trust me. I'm a little weird outside of church. You know what I mean? But the, re <laughs> but the reality is it's not even necessary. It's not going to build us closer together. It'll develop a physical relationship, and that's great. But what we have spiritually is much greater than that. It goes past this world. Past this world. Zechariah had to be shut so that he could understand the will of God and God's will can develop and happen in his life. He had to be shut maybe because he was going to share someone with somebody, something with somebody that was going to tell him, don't you see how old you are? Don't you see how many years you've been waiting and it hasn't happened? What makes you think you're going to be successful? Look at you. You're making $10,000 a year. What makes you think you're ever going to be a pastor of a million people in a church? Look at you. You're in a place that it rains inside when it rains outside. I'm just in transition, baby. I'm just in transition. Maybe he needed to shut up because sharing your dreams with too many people sometimes becomes a nightmare. Maybe you need to start keeping your dream quiet and just let it happen. I'm not even going to get into the second person today because I'm going to finish with Zachariah. This man stood mute, dumb as they call it, for some time. But it says in verse 23, and when his time of performing priestly functions was ended, he returned to his own house. Now after this, his wife Elizabeth became pregnant. And for five months, she secluded herself entirely, saying, I have hid myself. That talks about something. Why did she seclude herself? Maybe she understood what Zechariah had gone through, why he was mute. Maybe she got the vision. Maybe God showed her what it was. And maybe she said, I need to get away from all the distractions as well. I need to get away from all those people who are going to try to drag me to that place of non-belief. And I'm not talking about a human person. I'm talking about a mindset. I got to get away from these things that are dragging me down. I got to get away from this. I got to get away from that. I, I got to get to a place where it's just me and God. I got to seclude myself between me and God. And watch what happens in 25. Because thus the Lord has dealt with me in the days when he designed me, when he dined, when he dined to look on me, to take away my reproach among men. 
when she secluded herself, when he was quiet, was when they were able to see the promise of God in their life. In the physical, you look at somebody who can't speak, you don't see them as being powerful. I put next to you or in front of you right now someone who can't speak, and I put one of the best speakers in the world right here. Who are you going to look at in high esteem? The person that can speak. If I put my, one of my kids here and I put Anthony Robbins over here and you look, you're going to be looking at Anthony Robbins. Come on, motivate me. You're not going to be looking at that child because your physical sense, there's experience there. There's something there. But God says, don't look at the physical because that physical has gotten to its max. That doctor has gotten to its max. The doctor don't even know what to tell you anymore except that it's not going to happen. Their practice finished. They gave up. But God says, look at that child that tells you there's hope. Look at that child that tells you it can happen. And as you start looking at that child, you're going to begin to see what God has spoken over you come to pass. I'll finish with one question, and this is it. Do you have the power? Stand to your feet. Do you have the power? Thank you for joining the NBMI experience today. Like, comment, and subscribe at www.facebook.com slash NBMI New York or www.youtube.com slash NBMI Church. Also, check out our new and improved website at www.newbeginningschurches.com or iglesianuevoprincipio.com. Want to receive our daily devotional? Email us at info at newbeginningschurches.com to sign up. Thank you. Until next time, God bless.